part two of video series devoted to vegan deficiencies and how they influence human body. Today, we're entering territory of non-essential nutrients. And here, I would like to remind you something very important, that non-essential nutrients are made in our body by our cells from the actual precursors, from actual molecules, actual chemicals, and some of which may turn out to be actually essential nutrients. And the reactions of synthesis of non-essential nutrients, they happen not just in the presence of the precursors, but they also require certain conditions to be established, which require certain minerals that may require certain enzymes containing the minerals, basically certain homeostasis and the instructions for assembly of those nutrients. Hence, failure to consistently supply the actual precursors and all the cofactors may lead to reduced synthesis of those non-essential nutrients. This is something that we need to remember. And then another factor here is that in the conditions when the body does not receive non-strictly non essential nutrients from the diet, it may ramp up the production rate of those non-essential nutrients by sending the instructions to the responsible cells to overproduce this nutrient. So they will kind of start working over time. And the danger here is the following. So when, we're, when we don't supply proper nutrition to our body and we fully rely on the internal synthesis of certain non-essential nutrients, when we also fail to supply the necessary nutrition needed for establishing the conditions for those reactions to happen when we also develop certain complementary deficiencies that further make the process of synthesis stalled, make it, make it inefficient, make it impossible, then the cells that are responsible for producing those non-essential nutrients in the conditions of increased metabolic demand because nothing like the non-essential nutrient is not coming with the diet they may just do let's word it reach fatigue and not be able to meet those excessive metabolic demands for those non-essential nutrients that they are supposed to produce under the conditions of excessive demand. And there actually was a reason why I included methionine in the first part of the series. Right now we're going to talk about creatine. And creatine is an organic amino acid uh, that is synthesized from three amino acids, which is first will be methionine, then glycine, and the third amino acid, arginine. Thus, creatine is a non-essential nutrient. And before we jump into our discussion, I prepared a list of questions for vegans to think about. Question number one. Why do you think it is better to rely on the internal synthesis of non-essential nutrients only? Question number two. You can watch this video and like think as we go. Uh, maybe you have some already like established knowledge on the subject. Maybe you have some studies that demonstrate that, for example, synthesizing creatine internally only is a beneficial strategy. No since we're talking about creatine right now, but we will move on to talking about coenzyme Q10 and we'll also briefly men discuss something else. Then question number two, do you think that your body prefers to synthesize something that is otherwise readily available from food? Number three, why do you think your body wants to spare its resources to make the non-strictly essential nutrients instead of getting them partially from food? Number four, do you think that the body can keep producing enough of those nutrients throughout the lifetime and in changing conditions? Or do you think the body's ability to synthesize them decreases with time and should be used as a reserve function? Question number five, what do you do to ensure that you are getting enough of the precursors and create good environment for synthesizing all those nutrients in sufficient amounts at all times? And the last question, number six, is why do you think you should avoid the benefits of receiving certain non-strictly essential nutrients in the amounts higher than necessary for basic survival. So these were my questions. Please think about them, write them in the comments if you have something to say about it. And now let's move on to actually creatine. So synthesis of creatine happens in the liver, in the kidneys and the pancreas. As I mentioned above, methionine participates in synthesis of creatine and moreover 35% or more of methionine actually goes to produce 
creatine. So by definition, it is not an essential nutrient. However, its internal synthesis may not be sufficient, especially when certain conditions for its synthesis are not met. Creatine in like nutritionally appreciable relevant amounts, not in trace amounts, but actually measurable amounts, is only found in animal foods and animal tissues. And creatine is required for normal growth, development, and health. Whatever those terms mean, we will look into detail um, on that subject later. Creatine synthesis does not appear to place a major burden on glycine metabolism in adults, since this amino acid is readily synthesized. However, creatine synthesis does account for approximately 40% of all the labile methyl groups provided by s methionine and, as such, places an appreciable burden on the provision of such methyl groups, either from the diet or via de novo methylneogenesis. Creatine synthesis consumes some 20-30% of arginines and amidino groups, whether provided in the diet or synthesized within the body. Creatine synthesis is, therefore, a quantitatively major pathway in amino acid metabolism and imposes an appreciable burden on the metabolism of methionine and of arginine. Something super interesting on methionine and glycine we will actually discuss in the last part of this video, so stay tuned, because it will have some immediate relevance to this uh, subject, I think. Strictly speaking, we cannot talk about creatine deficiency per se, because it doesn't have well-defined clinical symptoms. Like with B12, we can open like B12 deficiency symptoms, and with some likelihood, we will have deficiency symptoms. With creatine, it's less so. It's more probably adequate to talk about creatine insufficiency, and this is because creatine supplementation in the conditions when we do not receive enough creatine with the diet, is usually associated with positive outcomes. Some research indicates the following benefits of creatine supplementation. Those benefits include boosting athletic and fitness performance by improving energy transfer and speeding up muscle recovery, providing neuroprotective effects in the elderly, uh, improving memory and reasoning abilities in the elderly with cognitive impairments and degeneration, um, increasing production of anabolic hormones such as insulin, growth hormone, uh, estrogen and testosterone, helping in managing or reversing osteoarthritis, helping in managing fibromyalgia, helping with people with neurodegenerative diseases, helping in prevention of stroke, helping in with skin rejuvenation, helping in reversing bone loss and sarcopenia, helping in heart health and contractility maintenance. Creatine may potentially have cancer prevention properties, so there's some ongoing research, you know, it's the most exciting field of early health studies. Every nutrient is being put to test against those matters. And then if we, th if we speak about creatine deficiency, then some studied outcomes of creatine deficiency or insufficiency include depression, cognitive impairments, stunted growth in children, fatigue, loss of muscle mass, and weight loss. Uh, which means if we combine all these factors without added creatine, either via supplementation or through the diet, we should expect somewhat suboptimal performance of the body and also in more which, which will be more pronounced in more vulnerable parts of population, such as elderly and children. And this may emphasize the importance of um, getting exogenous creatine as long-term abstinence from this nutrient coming from the diet on top of the internal synthesis may have some delayed or immediate health effects, some detrimental health effects. Some study I found was looking into the hepatocyte cellular culture of rats and they were studying how it will respond in terms of pr production of creatine to addition of methionine and turns out that addition of methionine to that cellular culture, which may not be strictly representative of what's happening inside of the body of course, but they noticed anywhere from 2.25 to, two to three-fold increase in creatine synthesis in response to the addition of methionine to this culture cell. So it is possible that internal synthesis of creatine may be to some extent stimulated by increase in dieter methionine, since again this amino acid is uh, the most used for production of creatine internally. Now let's read something else from the paper. About half of the creatine that the organism needs is normally ingested and taken up from the dietary sources. Creatine is not present in vegetables, but is only present in foods of animal origin. Thus, subjects who do not regularly consume meat or fish tend 
to have some degree of creatine deficiency. So if we see these authors actually name it a creatine deficiency here, and they should supplement creatine with their diet. Abstaining from animal products doesn't appear to be a viable idea if we aim to increase creatine levels. And we actually should talk later about what are the roles of creatine in the body, besides just like all of those associated improvements following creatine supplementation and possible deficiency outcomes. So we actually will look into what it actually does in the body. But if um, it is principal for you to abstain from animal products, then creatine supplementation may be something of interest. And especially if you're running vegan experiment on your children, uh, because again, as, as with um, other nutritional needs, creatine also may play a significant role in childhood development. And uh, this is something that you should consult about with your doctor to determine the proper dosage and necessity of such supplementation. However, like with other supplements, we, we only know, so when we design certain supplements as humans, we only know to design what we know of. But there is a whole array of things that we are not aware of. So when, when it comes to supplements, you enter very tricky territory. You need to really know what you're doing. You need to be on top of possible side effects, of possible complications of supplementation. How do you tailor the dose? How are you going to monitor your performance? How are you going to monitor the effects of those supplements? There's so many unknowns. And remember that the main principle of nutritional science is that nutritional goals must be targeted through food, through dietary sources, because food will always be superior as it brings not only the nutrients, but it brings nutrients very well proportioned. It brings nutrients with all the necessary cofactors that ensure that those nutrients will be used properly. This is something to, something to think about. But if you are on protein restricted diet, in particular methionine restricted diet, then you may face the problem of not synthesizing much creatine as is if you're not receiving it dietarily, then you're automatically falling, falling into the category of vegans, which consistently show that their creatine and the muscle, muscle content of creatine and production of creatine is pretty low. So this is something to be aware of at very least and take proper measures. Now let's read something else. Specific mechanisms of the benefit provided by creatine supplementation include, first, restoration of normal creatine content when it is lower than normal due to lifestyle, e.g. vegetarian or vegan subject, or to disease such as heart failure. <laughs> Like, it's always funny how when I read uh, certain, like, medical articles, when they talk about this deficiency is prevalent in, in, in people with rare genetic disorder, with heart failure, and in vegans. It's just, it, it always happens like this. Uh, second thing, specific mechanisms of the benefit by creatine supplementation include increase in energy availability. Obtained by increasing phosphocreatine concentration in the tissue in cases where the balance between energy availability and requirement is limited by decreased energy production, as in the case of hypoxia or ischemia, or by increased demand, e.g. the muscle of athletes during athletic performance. In general, like working out as vegan if you're not using any pharma or some hardcore isolate supplementation appears to be a very tricky thing to me because if you, build, if you have an avalanche of different deficiencies, then working out will lead to mostly catabolism, like some low-grade catabolic, ca catabolic processes. Because to work out and actually build something, it is necessary to supp supply very good, very concentrated nutrition. And when I, when I witness people who use like actual steroids and stuff to build their body, this appears to be a total madness because you're overstimulating depleted system. You're stimulating the cells force to force produce, um, like synthesize all those proteins, the muscle tissue, without providing enough resources for that. It's, it's such a pathway to just like speed of light aging, literally, because it will be sucking up all of the resources from the body that would otherwise go to repair, regeneration, like building new cells, building like normal hormones, building bones. It's it's kind of reckless. I also found this interesting paper when I was researching creatine. And I don't know if this specific sentiment, this specific finding can be correlated with dietary deprivation of creatine and in general, like being undersupplied with creatine. But 
This is something curious to be aware of and basically shows the relationship between creatine and heart function. Indeed, decreasing heart creatine per se has harmful effects on non-contractility. Sox et al. showed in frog hearts that decreasing cardiac creatine content caused decreased force of contraction. Ten Hove et al. developed a strategy to decrease the intracellular content of creatine in the rodent's hearts. They found that these hearts did not show significant anomalies at rest, but they had decreased contractile capacity when challenged with a sympathetic pathomimetic compound. In other words, they had a decreased contractility reserve and they could not efficiently increase cardiac output when stimulated. Moreover, they proved more vulnerable to ischemic damage. Kapelka et al. showed that isolated rat hearts, which had been, deple which had been depleted of creatine by treatment with guanidinopropionic acid, an antagonist of the creatine transporter, had near normal cardiac output when subjected to a submaximal pressure load, but showed a 43% decrease in um, pressure volume work at maximum pressure load. Both these latter papers suggested that decreased heart creatine content did not have major effects at rest or at low levels of stimulation, but prevented increased cardiac output at times of higher need for contractility. So let's discuss the function like basic functions of creatine. Basically, it is important for energy storage. Creatine is being turned into creatine phosphate and it serves as phosphate donor in the conversion of adenosine diphosphate into ATP, so triphosphate. It's used as a immediate source of energy for muscle contractions and in other organs that depend on creatine, such as brain such as heart. So creatine is used to recycle ATP, recycle energy. Creatine supplements are typically used, <laughs> prescribed, to treat muscle wasting associated with cancer and other chronic conditions. And I guess veganism. Up to 95% of uh, creatine is stored in skeletal muscles and the other 5% are distributed between brain, liver, kidneys, and testicles. Creatine is being lost daily. To account for those daily losses, an adult human needs about 2 grams of creatine per day. And our body can only synthesize 50% of this amount. A typical supplemental dose of creatine in certain therapies is about 5 grams per day. Foods high in creatine include herring, beef, pork, chicken, and tuna. Organ meats and wild animals, wild animal meat, they're also typically high in creatine. Again, even though creatine synthesis happens and it can be up and down regulated in human body, vegans consistently show lower stores of creatine in the muscle tissue, unless they supplement with creatine, of course. Now let's do some other fun read. The most striking demonstration of the importance of creatine to the brain is provided by the devastating consequences that attend the creatine deficiency diseases. However, other work also points to the importance of brain creatine. An intriguing study by Ray et al. examined the effects of creatine supplementation on performance in a number of cognitive tests. The subject, students from the University of Sydney, were either vegetarians or vegans, as it was thought that their creatine status may be somewhat compromised because of very low dietary intake of creatine. A double-blind placebo-controlled crossover trial was carried out in which the subject ingested a daily dose of 5 grams of uh, creatine monohydrate or placebo for 6 weeks. Then, after a 6-week washout period, the treatments were reversed. A number of cognitive tests that require speed of processing were administered at the beginning of the experiment and after each six weeks period. Creatine ingestion resulted in significantly improved performance on these tests. Figure 5 illustrates performance of the on the auditory backward digit span test. This test requires subjects to listen to a series of numbers and then to recite them backward. It involves short-term storage and active memory, both of which have high energy requirements. The remarkable result evident in Figure 5 is that at the end of the experiment, the subjects who had just completed six weeks of creatine intake could on average recite 8.5 digits backward, whereas those who had completed six weeks of placebo intake could on average recite seven digits backward. Studies such as this should stimulate new work on the role of creatine and cognitive processes. While you can live off the endogenous creatine supporting vital functions, it uh, may turn out to be not such a good idea to sustain such lifestyle over a long period of time. If you are looking for high quality of life and active longevity, of course. And if you choose to run vegan experiment on your children, then it is of special importance to go to the doctor and ask them, consult with them about the creatine supplementation. Because you should be aware that your child might want, as a result, to live life that spends outside of the vegan religion. 
They might have some ambitious goals in life. They might have certain like creative ideas. They may have some dreams in life. And for that, they would need a very powerful brain. They probably would want to be beautiful. They probably would want to achieve their genetic maximum. They probably would want to have the prime neurological health, very good muscle development, bone development. And this is your kind of probably partially yeah, responsibility, we should say, to provide your children with the best start. So with that in mind, when we put together all evidence regarding creatine, it may be a quite important and probably sometimes overlooked nutrient. Because I only noticed that vegans who go to the gym a lot, who try to be bodybuilders, they like to opt for creatine supplements. But in fact, it may be of prime importance for every vegan because, again, its, def it's deficiency can in some ways participate in bone loss and muscle wasting that are pretty common. They're very commonplace and also in childhood development, of course. And then given its roles in um, neurological conditions, given its neuroprotective effects and its role in prevention or delay, of if it's if we talk about like hereditary conditions that are related to cognitive deterioration in the advanced age, it may also be a really great measure to supplement with this nutrient for the sake of retention of sharpness and brain health, mental health as well. So this is something that you shouldn't overlook if you're a vegan. Again, people who consume animal products, who consume high quality animal products, they have a great advantage of that of all the protective effects of creatine. From my experience, potentially creatine also played a huge role in sped up recovery because I personally encountered that in vegan diet, I was very easily injured, but never recovered. So that was a problem. I think after this series is completed, I will put together the reverse analysis in which I will put all the systems of the body that are the most vulnerable and that, that are least resistant to the effects of vegan diet and we will analyze how many different deficiencies induce damage in certain systems to see what systems of body are most vulnerable most at risk in vegan population so this is what we'll do in the very end as a summary video but now we need to conclude here that yeah perhaps you can try both you can try living without supplemental creatine and then introduce it and see if you like the difference. And of course, it really depends on your lifestyle, whether you want to receive creatine through the diet or not. It really depends on what lifestyle you're looking to have, basically. So now let's move on since we're on this energy wizard subject. Let's now discuss coenzyme Q10. Coenzyme Q10, I put it in as a non-essential but insufficiently synthesized nutrient that is unreliably available on a vegan diet. And uh, you know, it is a pretty arguable nutrient, whether we should be worried about it or not. But there are several important factors to think about. So basically, coenzyme Q10 is, of course, found predominantly in organ meats. This is where you will get the highest concentration of coenzyme Q10. From vegan foods, you can get coenzyme Q10 in smaller amounts in general, plus also multiplied by the bioavailability fudge factor. Then, when it comes to internal synthesis of coenzyme Q10, I found several papers in which, in one, it stated that our body synthesizes all necessary coenzyme Q10. In some papers, it says that our body, by no, in two papers, I think I found that our body is not able to synthesize all essential, all necessary amount of coenzyme Q10. So today, I would like to compile some information about coenzyme Q10 that we can use for our advantage. And of course, having a knowledge about where it's found, in what quantities it is advised to be taken or consumed daily is important maybe empowering for regardless of our diet but indeed it is probably unfair to claim that you're not going to have enough coenzyme q10 because again there's divergence in information however coenzyme q10 in some papers serves as a predictor of active longevity and good basically condition good resilience against chronic diseases and stuff like that so how so consuming a lot of coenzyme q10 is one to be beneficial and promotes the um, um, kind of reproductive longevity. It promotes overall longevity because, again, it's a coenzyme that participates in energy transfer processes as well. And also it helps to regenerate antioxidants, so it protects the cells against oxidative stress. And we'll go through the functions coenzyme Q10 
in this block as well. But first, let's introduce the uh, definitions here. So what is enzyme? What is coenzyme? If we think about the enzymes, enzymes are protein molecules that catalyze the reaction or speed it up. They do not directly participate in the reactions. They are not getting disposed or used in the reaction. They only serve as catalysts, being like mediating the reaction, basically. And when we think about coenzymes, coenzymes actually activate the enzymes. They are not proteins. They are no non-protein molecules that help enzymes perform their catalyst, catalyst activity. Unlike enzymes, coenzymes are being altered in the course of the chemical reaction. They're small molecules, they're non-protein molecules, and again, they switch the enzyme, enzymatic reaction. Coenzyme Q10. Coenzyme, so its functions include the following. So, it's needed for energy conversion. It converts energy and carbohydrates and fatty acids into the ATP. So, this is something you need to think. That I receive so many comments from carb, carbohydrate people who are <laughs> preaching carbohydrate consumption, exclusively carbohydrate consumption. Think about this little thing here. It's not just about glucose. Energy synthesis is much more than glucose, in fact. Then, coenzyme Q10 is an essential antioxidant. Besides being antioxidant himself, it regenerates other antioxidants in the body. Then, it stimulates cell growth and inhibits cell death. So, it promotes cell pro proliferation, basically. Extends the lifespan of the cell, I guess. Then, it spares vitamin E, which is an interesting thing. This is one of the examples of self-regulation when we choose between certain diets because... In diets that are naturally low in vitamin E, if they're whole food, like for example, animal-based diet, will be low in vitamin E, but it will be high in coenzyme Q10. So there will be this compensation mechanism happening and vice versa. Then, uh, it participates in correction of mitochondrial leak of electrons during oxidative respiration. For me, as a, for an engineer, for a, a semiconductor engineer, it's actually pretty interesting how biological functions, their efficiency, their energy efficiency also depends on the leakage, on the integrity, on the electronic integrity and lack of defects, structural defects that cause loss of um, carriers, for example. So it's pretty interesting for me to learn about it. Then, uh, coenzyme Q10 has beneficial effect on prostaglandin metabolism. Prostaglandins cause contractions. Their inflammation, hormones, stabilization of integrity of calcium ion-dependent slow channels and possibly potassium channels. Then, coenzyme Q10 spares vitamin C, A, and beta carotene by decreasing their self con cell consumption. Again, just like with vitamin E, we're dealing with this compensation effect. If you are eating vegan foods, but predominantly raw vegan foods, then you will be getting a lot of vitamin C. If you receive a lot of beta carotene and actually absorb it, if you don't shy off fats, then you also may be getting some compensation if you are under eating coenzyme Q10. I am not really sure though how it works for all other functions that I listed, but when it comes to certain antioxidant vitamins, yes, there's some compensation. And this is why, perhaps in some cases, uh, with whole food, like some rational, rationed vegan diet, uh, coenzyme Q10 deficiency may not be an issue. And again, how do we define coenzyme Q10 deficiency? I will read you several examples from other papers from which it will be more evident that there is some confusion going on in the papers. Then, coenzyme Q10 may prevent the oxidation of LDL cholesterol and inhibit atherosclerosis. So this is another thing. And actually, LDL and coenzyme Q10 are related, and we will see how. So the body produces coenzyme Q10, and it happens through the following steps. Because as I mentioned, non-essential nutrients, we need to be aware of what are the conditions for production of those non-essential nutrients besides certain stimulation coming from the body in response to metabolic limitations of accessibility of certain nutrients. Besides that, what, what goes into the pot in which we are making our nutrients? So, the intracellular biosynthesis of coenzyme Q10 begins from tyrosine through a cascade of eight aromatic precursors which indispensably require eight vitamins, namely tetrahydrobiopterin, vitamins B6, C, B12, B12, 
B2, folic acid, niacin, and pantothenic acid. Mevalonate is one of the precursors of coenzyme Q10, which is also included in the biosynthesis of cholesterol. It has been shown that the endogenous synthesis of coenzyme Q10 is inhibited by cholesterol-lowering drugs, statins, which inhibit mevalonate biosynthesis and supplementation, has therefore been suggested for some of their users. Then from the other paper, ubiquinone deficiency, which is active form of coenzyme Q10, may be due to insufficient Efficient dietary intake, impairment in coenzyme Q10 biosynthesis, excessive utilization by the body in the conditions of certain degenerative diseases, increased um, um, oxidative stress, which can be caused, of course, by the poor diet consisting of a lot of processed foods, like junk food diets, basically, or a combination of any three. Now I have like some questions here. We listed several vitamins that are necessary for synthesizing coenzyme Q10. Several of these vitamins, such as B6 and vitamin B12, are of concern on a vegan diet. B6, in particular, it, um, it's, um, it's pretty ambivalent issue we will be discussing it in some of the next chapters and some of the next parts of this series because there are very powerful inhibitors of vitamin b6 absorption so it's not even that the supply is insufficient there, there are actually very powerful inhibitors that almost vanish the accessible b6 on a vegan diet so there might be an issue and we'll discuss it later we'll analyze it in detail further b6 as you know is on my table of nutrients and then with b12 vitamin then this is also something interesting to study because b12 again deficiency of b12 can happen on the background of taking a supplement it can happen if there are complementary nutritional deficiencies that may cause cellular b12 deficiency so these two things are kind of of concern if we look at the studies vegans do show lower plasma concentration of coenzyme Q10 compared to omnivore population. It's something like 25%, 30% lower. However, they have higher relative active form of coenzyme Q10 in their bloodstream, which, which may indirectly indicate that they have lower oxidative stress. It's an open question whether having lower coenzyme Q10 is a some risk factor for development of degenerative diseases that may be associated with lacking the antioxidant effects of coenzyme Q10, its protective effects. So this is from the paper. Plasma concentrations of total coenzyme Q10 were found to be significantly lower in the vegetarian vegan group and actually they were appended together, compared with the omnivore group. In contrast, the ubiquinol total coenzyme Q10 ratio was significantly higher in the vegetarian and vegan group. Significantly, they put... 97 versus 97.13 versus 96.8, which is interesting. No differences were observed in plasma concentrations of iron, zinc, and calcium between the groups. Although it is unknown whether the lower total coenzyme Q10 plasma concentration in the vegetarian vegan group predicts an increased risk associated with age-related diseases, further studies will, with extended marker scale and time span may identify convenient biomarkers to predict such risks. So this is something that we know for um, if we compare the population but again it was an open question in general all of those like it is creatine coenzyme q10 they're very uh, intriguing for the for the researchers because they show very promising results when it comes to you know, active longevity and uh, their ability to basically reverse aging so this is something intriguing i'm very curious to see further studies to come so when it comes to replenishment of coenzyme q10 we need half a gram per day to be replenished either via internal synthesis or through the diet. And now we read here that coenzyme Q10 deficiency is rare because its level in the human body is mainly maintained by endogenous synthesis. However, some drug treatments and pathophysiological conditions result in suboptimal coenzyme Q10 levels. Since its deficiency has been related to aging processes and several diseases such as cancer, heart failure, or sarcopenia, coenzyme Q10 has gained wide popularity among researchers. It has been shown to boost energy levels, stimulate the immune system, act as a free radical scavenger, prevent premature skin aging, and combat cardiovascular and neurodegenerative diseases. Other benefits associated with coenzyme Q10 include potentially aiding in the control of diabetes and post-cardiac surgery recovery. Now let's study how it works. It relocates electrons for ATP, a production in the electron transport chain, and acts as a lipophilic antioxidant in its reduced form by preventing the oxidation of 
proteins, polyunsaturated fatty acids, and DNA. Then, another interesting thing about, vit about, not vitamin, about coenzyme Q10 is that it is a fat-soluble compound. So, coenzyme Q10 is better absorbed when consumed with an oil or fat-rich meal. So, this is another interesting fact about coenzyme Q10 if we rely on the dietary supply or want to boost its consumption with a diet. Because it is a fat-soluble compound, that soluble molecule, a large portion of the exogenous dose of ubiquinone is deposited in the liver and packaged into very low density lipoprotein. So synthesis of coenzyme Q10 decreases with age or it's wasting, potentially is being increased with age because there are because of the array of different failures, because of lack of regeneration. So potentially there is higher demand for coenzyme Q10 and aging, it is reasonable to be aware of this nutrient and potentially strive to increase its consumption. Then another factor that I learned was that coenzyme Q10 by synthesis can be stimulated through exercise. And actually a lot of it is stored in the muscle tissue. The best dietary sources of coenzyme Q10 are of course organ meats, so it will be livers and hearts, primarily beef and chicken liver and hearts. So if you want to, if you have any concerns about your coenzyme Q10 levels if you are recovering post-vegan, ex-vegan, then it is probably a worthy thing to consider an reduction of organ meat into your diet. Another article reiterates the um, lipophilic nature of coenzyme Q10. It's a, I think it's micellar structure, so it's hydrophobic. Coenzyme Q10 is a lipophilic molecule present in cell membranes, but especially abundant in mitochondria because, again, it's an energy mediator. Mitochondria are responsible for energy production. And then greater bioavailability of coenzyme Q10 can be obtained if it's taken with meals because of the action of secreted bile acids. This is another interesting thing because, for example, there's a huge movement of fat-free vegans. There's a huge movement of fruitarians who don't casually, who don't routinely purge their gallbladder. So I'm wondering if that can have any impact on the uh, coenzyme Q10 metabolism problems. So this is something to think about if you are on very restricted diet, on some like total fat diet, which restricts macronutrients, because again, you need to stimulate the bile secretion in order to actually extract, metabolize coenzyme Q10. Diets deficient in coenzyme Q10 may cause coenzyme Q10 deficiency and decreased dietary ingestion is presumed in chronic malnutrition, whatever malnutrition means. Then another evidence here is that from another resource that I found that coenzyme Q10 deficiency in tissues is typically caused by decreased biosynthesis or conversion in the active form due to aging, taking medications like statins, in certain health conditions or due to genetic mutations. Conventional diets typically do not supply enough coenzyme Q10. And I'm assuming because it is found in organ meats, in the United States, organ meats are not being consumed as unlike in the rest of the world because organ meats are part of any traditional culture. It's impossible to find any traditional cuisine without organ meat consumption. So this is something unique to, for the very refined post food industrialization world, probably so. Plasma coenzyme Q10 status reflects both hepatic synthesis and dietary intake, and therefore it may not truly represent the cellular level of this isoprenoid. The factors responsible for inducing a deficit in coenzyme Q10 status is secondary coenzyme Q10 deficiencies are currently not completely understood, but in some cases may be disease-specific. For example, the inhibition of the mevalonate pathway by high phenylalanine concentrations or the low blood levels of vitamin B6 reported in MPS patients. The active form of vitamin B6 pyridoxal 5-phosphate is an important cofactor required by the coenzyme Q10 biosynthetic pathway. So if I was uh, thinking of the concerns associated with coenzyme Q10 in the context of vegan nutrition, this is probably where I would be looking because its biosynthesis is tied to other possible nutritional factors. And clearly, as studies show, vegans do not receive nor synthesize nearly as much coenzyme Q10 as the omnivore population. And this is, again, vegans lumped with vegetarians who still have some animal products in their diet that, no, I mean, have less 
Kwanjam Kitan compared to meats, but they still have some. So with that in mind, it is a very interesting problem to, to analyze where it is actually a worthy concern for vegans. So I would just like to highlight the importance of this nutrient and um, perhaps inspire your own research if you want to stick with a vegan diet. Because again, coenzyme Q10 is not a problem on, a, on an omnivore diet that is enriched with a plethora of high-quality animal products. So here we will look into coenzyme Q10 sources in foods. Beef heart contains 11.3 milligrams per 100 grams, beef liver 3.9 per 100, chicken heart 9.2 per 100, chicken liver 11.6 per 100, mackerel 6.7 per 100, beef muscle meat 3 per 100, reindeer meat 15.8 per 100, boiled soybeans 1.2 grams per 100, tofu 0.3 per 100, soy milk 0.25 per 100, broccoli contains um, the most coenzyme Q10 among vegetables, it contains 0.75 milligrams per 100 grams. But again, be mindful that in broccoli, nutrients will be locked in the insoluble fiber matrix. So you need to find out the fudge factor, correction factor by availability. Then pistachios contain 2 milligrams per 100 grams, sesame seeds 1.7 per 100, peanuts 2.6 per 100. Peanuts in general are very, very arguable food. It's um, They contain a huge amount of advanced glycation end products and they actually are pretty harmful for the gut. So well, getting sufficient amount of coenzyme Q10 through biosynthesis, through the diet, again, very arguable subject, can potentially aid in preventing and treating such conditions as cardiovascular diseases, high blood pressure, cancer, periodontal disease, mitochondrial disorders, radiation injury, obesity, diabetes, Parkinson's disease, Alzheimer's disease, acquired immune deficiency syndrome, gastric ulcers, allergy, fibromyalgia, migraine headaches, kidney failure, muscular dystrophy, egg degradation, and aging. These are all inconclusive. The studies are ongoing. We are on the territory again of the um, nut nutrient that is being actively researched. So there are still contradictions in the papers and things that we can take for our advantage regardless. But um, the thing is that, again, when it comes to vegan diet, when you have complementary deficiencies when you start introducing some wear and tear because your body works overtime compensating for certain other nutrient deficiencies this is when the need for coenzyme q10 may be higher because vegan diet effectively simulates the um, advanced age with that in mind, coenzyme Q10 may be, so, may be a very good supplement to pay attention to, but granted that if you want to restore your nutrition and start eating actual animal products with comprehensive nutrients that combat the consequences of vegan malnutrition, then you will be automatically getting coenzyme Q10. So it won't be a problem. But again, it may not be of prime importance in a vegan diet, but again, be aware that vegans tend to have lower coenzyme Q10 through both synthesis and compounded through both synthesis and nutritional supply. And again, monitor all other deficiencies because those deficiencies may inhibit adequate form synthesis of coenzyme Q10. And now, <laughs> and now this part will be funny. This is uh, chapter three. And I was planning to talk about the collagen triad because the issue of collagen in vegans was of super acute interest of mine because it is so visible. I felt it firsthand. It was terrible. Vegan skin is a super real thing. When I started studying certain papers, I realized that there are several articles from recent years that show that vegan skin does not respond well to collagen stimulating procedures. The effect is not as pronounced and it fades away very rapidly. And scientists, they hypothesize what may be happening to a vegan skin in terms of collagen synthesis. Then I looked at the papers that studied scarring in vegan skin. Turns out that vegans fail to produce high quality collagen fibers and uh, form normal scar tissue that will heal well. So this is another thing. So there are changes in how body synthesizes collagen on a vegan diet. Plus also, depending on the protocol, depending on the vegan diet, there might be a prevalent process of collagen destruction. I actually made a very good video. I was it was geared towards pretty much any diet because I was studying the mechanisms of collagen formation and collagen preservation. So you can watch it. I discussed everything that goes into collagen synthesis, just as in any other protein synthesis, and then in some specific factors that promote collagen formation. 
what is needed for that. I tried hitting all of those factors. I tried to accommodate all those factors through the diet. It didn't work. All of those collagen supplements that people take <laughs> on vegan diet, like quasi collagen supplements, like collagen uh, promoting nu nutritional powders, they don't work. There is collagen loss. One factor for collagen loss in a vegan diet is, of course, hyperhomocysteinemia that causes breakdown of collagen. On the other hand, there are certain nutritional factors that may contribute to failure to synthesize collagen. There are three amino acids, three key amino acids that go into formation of collagen. It's glycine, proline, and hydroxyproline. Glycine and proline are they exist on a vegan diet. Yes, their absorption from food is inhibited. Yes, there is less glycine on a vegan diet compared to the meat-containing diet, omnivore diet. But regardless, they exist. And another interesting thing uh, that I, I learned when I started preparing for this video, for this blog, was that vegans, they receive much less glycine dietarily, but they have much higher glycine in their blood supply, bloodstream. The papers are new, so there is no fresh data, fresh information on that. And the authors of the papers, they're completely, strangely not curious to investigate this. Why do omnivore people use up the glycine that they produce and receive with food and vegans just have a ton of circulating glycine, which actually makes up larger fraction of collagen molecules. So it has it, there is twice as much glycine than any than proline or hydroxyproline in the in the composition of collagen fibers, and it makes up quarter of collagen total. Why does this glycine do? Does, does nothing. So literally it's just high circulating glycine that doesn't benefit anything. When it comes to the glycine metabolism in people who eat a lot of meat, glycine helps to neutralize the effects of breakdown of excessive like amino acids that are not used. So it helps to neutralize the acidic metabolites from destruction of lysine, methionine, and also homocysteine and cysteine. In vegans, somehow, this effect doesn't happen. So apparently, homocysteine regulation is broken in a way that glycine cannot compensate for it in vegans metabolically. This also shows that vegans, despite all the screaming that they get enough protein, they do not get nearly as much protein with their diet. Even when they hit all the macros goals, it shows that there is deficiency in lysine and methionine because there is no glycine that's getting expanded to neutralize the um, metabolites that happen from breakdown of those amino acids. So this is something interesting that I would like to dig into because, again, vegans exhibit the same similar profile with regard to glycine as people with some genetic disorders or liver or kidney problems. When they consume glycine, presumably produce glycine, it's non-essential nutrient, but they don't use it up, so it just circulates in the bloodstream. When it comes to collagen synthesis, my hypothesis is that collagen synthesis in vegans is hindered by the complex of other deficiencies that cause this like sunken eyes, super creepy like skin, joint destruction, bone bone loss, bone the bone loss due to specifically the protein loss due to collagen crosslinking and uh, failure to synthesize new collagen. So this is something that I would like to make a separate video about. Because as you see in my table, glycine, proline, hydroxyproline, I classify them as not essential, but insufficiently synthesized nutrients that yes, glycine yeah, should be supplemented with the diet. It's a very critical amino acid that especially, it's especially of critical importance for people who eat meat, who eat protein heavy diets. But glycine regardless participates in so many processes. There's a huge list of functions for glycine, proline, and then hydroxyproline, elevated hydroxyproline in the bloodstream also is an indicative of uh, catabolic processes. So it's also something interesting to study. So since I am perplexed with this issue, uh, I cannot really discuss glycine deficiency on a vegan diet. Because clearly there is no use for the extra glycine, for example, on a vegan diet, because it cannot be used potentially. It's my hypothesis that I still need to um, uncover, prove or disprove due to other deficiencies that disable the possibility 
of, for example, collagen synthesis on a vegan diet. Or not disable it completely, but hinder recovery of collagen. And this, again, seeing that uh, glycine in one of its roles is, again, to counteract the lysine catabolism knowing that vegan diet is lysine deficient and lysine actually does participate in formation of collagen. This may be the culprit. So we will need to study glycine proline hydroxyproline in conjunction with possibly retinol and also lysine because there must be a relationship because you know for reaction you need certain supply of nutrients and certain nutrients will be reaction limiting and i think there there is something to it if we are discuss glycine proline hydroxyproline specifically in the context of collagen synthesis because this was my initial idea there are certain functions that will be limited by other deficiencies other than glycine proline hydroxyproline so supplementation with for further supplementation with glycine beyond nutritional supply that is lower in vegans than in omnivores is kind of unreasonable because there is already a lot of glycine in the bloodstream. So this is something that I decided to separate in a standalone video and discuss maybe as one of the chapters of this series. So we'll be studying glycine proline hydroxyproline along with lysine and possibly retinol. So this is what we'll set in a separate chapter. So this was part two and I will See you in the part three.